Let's get, get started here. Okay. And uh, I think our crowd is getting a little bit more uh, nervous. <laughs> yes. No, they started yeah. celebrating. You must see the chat messages. They have put A and yeah. <laughs> they're getting excited. So good. Uh, let me start with this video at first. Uh, new Volkswagen Jetta. Sometimes everything just comes together. On the road of life, there are passengers and there are drivers.
and uh, let's get started with this show. Uh, this evening, tonight, uh, th this is when you saw, when you expect something to go wrong, everything goes wrong. Uh, but such is the uh, facts of life. Uh, one of the things that we focused on uh, for, uh, for this evening is really to talk about uh, a story of a, a le of a legend that spent years of his life focusing on what is to be done next, the highest level. For 24 years we, at Identity Branding Forum, we focused on really searching for what is unique. And Mike Salisbury is the one, if, if anything that is unique, Mike Salisbury is one person that is fascinating in every little details about him. And today we're gonna to be talking about why the, 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 this personality is behind the numerous numbers of success stories around the world. Uh, our Identity Branding Forum, we have actually done, uh, created a number of programs and the latest of them at the top is the Talents of Endearment Career Labs. And our aim basically is to create le legendary, passionate people, students. And what would be, be an ideal opportunity is to, to, to talk about it with the person with us. And I'm honored as one person talking about from a, an individual, a person to me is a hero and master from creating Michael Jackson's iconic black and white uh, look to branding Levi's 501 and helping market over 300 movies, including Raiders of the Lost Ark, Star Wars and Jurassic Park. Worn by Marian, uh, Marlon Brando, uh, Baron von Richfon, Richofen, I'm sorry if I mispronounced it correct, wrongly, uh, James Dean, Madonna, Elvis, uh, the Ramones, uh, Jean, Paul, Jean Paul Glitier, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Michael Jackson, the Beatles, Mike, uh, Mick Jagger, Bruce Springsteen, The Clash, David Bowie, how did the most photographed icon of pop culture get to be that? When you start reading all the phenomenal work that he did, you stutter, you stop, and you, you look with the highest respects and amazement for the work. Was it marketing or becoming socially accepted as something symbolizing the antisocial? Today, we are honored to talk to the man himself behind the story of the black leather motorcycle jacket and the branding of Rebel Culture 501 jeans and Michael Jackson. Mr. Mike Salisbury has more than fascinating career. His life should be documented in a movie. And perhaps someday this is gonna happen because it's worth it for generations all over the world. To understand more about the legend, let us try to understand some of his career stops for us to understand what it takes to become a legend or create a legend. We are lucky to be talking to one of the most captivating legends of the world. And I apologize for the, the technology failures early on, but I'm sure the rest of this show is gonna be more fascinating than it is. To begin with, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Osman Sultan for a welcome note. Uh, Mr. Osman, would you please? You are muted. We can't hear Mr. Osman. Osman, we cannot hear you. Technology is playing tricks on us tonight. <laughs> We cannot hear you, Mr. Osman. Refresh your page, please. Mr. 
Mr. Osman, we cannot hear you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay. So, thank you very much, Dr. Abed. Michael, my apologies as well. It's not an optimal way to start your presence with us. Really sorry for that. Uh, but I hope that the interaction that you will have will uh, make it up uh, for all of us. Let me uh, just start to heat a little bit the discussion. And let me speak a few minutes about my interaction as a chief executive officer in the last 25 years with branding. I uh, am very proud that always people were referring to me as, and people who work in the media companies and the advertising companies and the communication agencies, they used to say one of the CEOs that is the most involved and has his hands in the kitchen of communication and the kitchen of the brand. Uh, brands that, the two main brands that I worked in day uh, and night were something related to communication, mobile, telephony. And you know how this is important because this is a brand that is people carry with them every day. I mean, like um, what Michael did, these were things that created a culture. Today, uh, the technology, the social media, the internet space, the digital universe are becoming a new format of culture. And I've seen during these last uh, 25 years where I was at the helm of uh, uh, these companies, their strategy, I have seen an evolution. I have seen the time where we used to look at a brand more in, as a logo, colors, uh, ads, advertisement, uh, musical jingle maybe, brands were known because they had their musical or their sound fingerprint, a slogan, a tagline, etc., etc. Then we see a shift and the more brands became, became important, we started to see this shift toward the entire feeling good of users of these products, these services, uh, how they were feeling about that and moving up to become a synonym of the holistic user experience, the end, the end user experience from mm. the way uh, uh, they interact first with the brand to the first point of uh, touch to the engagement with the brand then to the channels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Today, the more this is becoming something we are seeing, and I'll, 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 I'll give some examples. This is brands are becoming the heart, soul, and set of values by which every company, by which every venture, every journey identify itself. So it's not only about the color and how your ads are, uh, more and more we hear within the corporate universe the word on brand this is on brand it means that everything your employees everything the people that are in charge of interacting with customers or even in the back office that have an impact on the chain of the service or the product that you're going to present to your customers or users from the guy who is sitting in HR to the person who is in the finance department or in the procurement department, they need to think, they need to breathe every moment of their life, of their corporate life, they need to breathe the values of this brand. This is how it, it, it is becoming important. And if you this holistic effect, if I can take a metaphor, uh, I'm just 
just thought about it now that I have seen some fragments of uh, 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 what we have seen from the video. You have a domino effect that you remember this this domino effect that and where all the chain of domino something can happen on your pricing scheme or something can happen in an experience you have with one of your employees and your brand and the way users interact with your product is going to be affected we heard recently about debates and people who just uh, started to leave uh, the Google company because Google took a position with some uh, people who were in the artificial intelligence because of some positions, etc. A lot of people, a lot of users were involved in this debate and said, we don't like how this brand that we trust is dealing with its employees. So it's really becoming uh, holistic things. Now on the consumer, if you just notice on the consumer side, while I have known a time where I, for instance, personally, I am from a generation who did not like wearing signs of brand in a visible way. I might uh, like a bell, but I was a little bit reluctant on having the sign of the, uh, of the bell or on a shirt or on a t-shirt having this uh, at unless it was in a very discreet way there was a relation that a generational relation with that now i can see with my teenager kids that the more the brand is big and visible or if uh, and if you see some uh, ladies you know that we have more on on you know tennis shoes or on on uh, 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 t-shirts or even on the brand is hugely uh, uh, displayed all over uh, the uh, uh, thing that you are wearing. This is to say that this is really becoming uh, really a mainstream. Now, I will finish with the last and for me the most important. More and more, each of us specifically with the spread of social media each and every one of us is building you might not know it but in your presence you are building your own brand and this is why uh and talent of endearment uh, dr abed introduced me as the chairman of talent of endearment and he is uh, the main driver around that and what i like is some of the things that we help is to bring a methodology. We never claim to say to someone, this should be or that should be your brand. But we just uh, try to engage, to open the conversation by just putting some headlines that can help everyone knowing, formatting, framing this exercise that is done very, uh, uh, most generally is done in a spontaneous manner is done in a non-structured manner because today uh, elections are won, political elections are won more on the branding of a person rather than on a program of a party and a whole structure. Leadership in the world is built around the branding of this leadership uh, itself, herself or himself. So. I believe that this is something that is getting more and more important in the individual lives and actually uh, brands are becoming uh, the sum of each and every brand of the person that is working in providing this product or services. If you talk with companies, I was at the helm of Do, a mobile a telecom, a telecommunication operator here in the UAE for the last 15 years, I mean, uh, excluding 2020, where I was, uh, I, I, I uh, left my executive uh, position. And I can assure you that every single person working for this company, his own or her own brand will at the end make this 
large, you know, la large river made of all these droplets of individual grants. I don't Thank want you. to say more. I think we have today a, a guru. We have a legend who really contributed in a fingerprint in our lives, all of us. So I would, uh, uh, without delay, just I would uh, leave uh, the legend, uh, Michael Sasbury, uh, tell us how he feels uh, about branding and the brands. So thank, thank you, you for these so words. Thank you, Dr. Abbott. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to also, we are being joined on by another president of a university, Khawarizmi International College, with Dr. Asim Al Hajj. Uh, and he's he wants to listen because he, we want to see how we can transform this culture back to the to students all over in UAE and around the world. Uh, Dr. Christopher, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good evening. I today understood a new dimension for the word legend. If you're a legend, people would bear with technological hiccups. People would be patient to wait and listen to the legend. So without much ado, I'm going to talk straight to the, the legend himself, Michael. Michael, the first question that we want to ask you pertains to that little wall. That wall is not a simple wall. It's a wall that's been built out of many years of labor, sweat, tears, and brains. And if I were to ask you, which I think is a very rhetoric question, which of those, and there are many bricks in that wall, but we would like to know if you have a favorite brick that you built among all these bricks over all these years. Go ahead, Michael, all yours. No, it's all dependent on the execution and how, uh, uh, to me, that's um, what the craft is, is not particularly that, word but how it was executed how that symbol how it was executed what the symbolism is cool and you know it's like asking michelangelo another michael of many centuries back which was his favorite piece and he would say every single one of them so yes. i agree with you michael when you said that yeah every single one comes with that passion comes with the heart it's that context that determines it and the symbolism thank you very much Thank you. Let's look at, yeah, let's look at another dimension. This is you, beginning, and we're calling it the American way, the beginning. Yeah. Tell us a little more about your early years. What made you this rebel with the cost, the maverick who went anti-establishment to make a point and to make yourself a legend? What was that, your early years? Well, I always wanted to get attention. <laughs> so beautiful. So sucking. Yes. Yeah. I wanted to get attention. The only way is to be a way, contrarian. Brilliant thought, sir. Thank you very much. And then now let's look at the legendary branding. Okay. This is who you were when you were a little kid. Okay. So how did legendary branding become synonymous with the word, with the name Mike Salisbury? Well, promoting myself. <laughs> Would you like to give us some tips about how we can do that? and stay relevant even after 50 years of continuously building different bricks on that beautiful wall? Well, I don't think there's any one particular trick. Um, but a lot of people are eager to know those tricks. Yes, well, one of the things I communicate with is metaphors. Mm. I create metaphors. Okay. Take two so things that, that have never been yes. combined and combine them. You, you, will, you will see that. One thing I've learned from Michael, uh, over the past few, uh, few weeks working with him, preparing for this, is I'm actually learning a lot the way he communicates briefly with one or two words to express everything that he's, uh, he's about. Probably and that's that fascinating. Not it's not a powerful communication. A few words, uh, suckingly, and then get Absolutely. And I'm learning a lot from, uh, from Michael on, on that end uh, of it. Mike, here's another question, okay? That... Yeah. You've been very daring in your communication messages, always very radical, very different. Weren't you at any point of time worried and anxious? Probably this could fail. How do you react to that? Once again, I'm sorry. I mean, you've been very daring, very bold in your ideas, bold in your execution. And when you were, you know, in the contemplation stage while you were designing it, weren't you worried and anxious that what if it fails? Did you go through that process? 
explain it to us well uh possibly yes um the big part was always getting the client to buy mm, and that didn't right. work, and then that's a fa failure mm, okay and uh, so that must have been a you know humongous task in convincing the client right uh it depends you know um like when we do movies sometimes like for jurassic park to come up with that logo and that uh badge that took hundreds and hundreds of sketches before steven spielberg was happy with it okay. so and then some things like this west cover i did that just for myself that was ed ruche painted that for me he's now the world's highest priced artist oh, wow beautiful that that's a that's a frustrating t time when you go through hundreds and hundreds of artwork and pieces uh waiting for that yes let's go for that uh stressful journey you know what and it was i i did all these uh and we did some radical things i mean in terms of execution beautiful artwork and so on for jurassic park and over and over and we get called, they get called in the middle of the night to come up with more for the next morning. And I remember I was driving back to LA from San Francisco, going down the Sunset Strip, and I looked over in a wall, and there was a wild posting, which means it is a, a, this, this, where they just post posters all over. And it was of the Jurassic Park, and it said Jur Jurassic Park, they're real. And I go, huh. I don't recognize that. So I went back and looked in my files because it was really ugly. And it was one I did by hand myself trying to put together the schlockiest pieces I could. And they bought that. So who knows? That's right. What we think is right may not be right for the others. And what we think may not work would probably appeal. So that's a very interesting, you know, contrarian perspective. Well, one thing I was very prolific. I could do a lot of different concepts. In movies, that's what they ask you because there's a lot of money riding on a movie and they want to make sure they get the right thing that works. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of formula that you'd like to say, you know, for example, now that we know that you've been creating these radical ones, you know, great connect with the starts as we call it. What is very special about you keeping strong in a cutthroat, brutal industry? You have sustained, you've been there, you've grown, you're still around. What's that magic mantra that you'd like to share with us? Oh, it's just like I said, using my brain as a library, storing up everything. Um, also, I have a big library and, uh, uh, and, and be, you know, be willing to um, come up with endless ideas, unless there's one that just strikes me as just being right. And, uh, but that's not sometimes my decision to decide whether that's right. It's like the clients. I love your metaphor, the library in the brain. I yeah. think what we need to do is transfer the libraries from outside into our brains. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you very much. Excellent thought. Thank you. You know, you have a long list of clients, musicians, uh, automakers, magazines, movies, fashion industry. So how would you estimate your you know relationship with them in terms of what we call popular demand what made all these attractive to all of them and which of those industries was a favorite for you you've cut across so many industries yes well it's because if i sold one thing people figured i might be able to sell something else <laughs> that, that's really simple Yes. But you, you have a heart on anything or everything is equally important and exciting. I think the brick on the wall is the same answer. Thank you. Yep. Great. Let's move on. What is the story behind the bike, Mike? Go ahead. Well, um, I wanted to get to the heart of uh, the rebel culture. And um, the motorcycle has that, is a symbol of that. And uh, uh, I was doing, uh, I was asked to do a campaign for Triumph Motorcycles to bring them back. So I was riding one of them on a test and I stopped at a gas station and this motorcycle gangster came up to me and pointed to the Triumph, which was out of production for a while and said, that bike has the story. And he's right, Triumph did. So I started telling the story. And one of the stories was Marlon Brando was associated with it. James Dean was associated with it. So all these people that contributed to popular culture vocabulary 
were part of that. Same with the jacket, the leather jacket. What a story. Thank you so much. Thank I mean, you. a lot of us are enlightened that there was such a beautiful story behind the Triumph bike. Yes. Well, let's go on. A lot of campaigns that you've done are kind of anti-establishment, anti-social, if I may use the word in context, you know, and you've always made change as the center of all your work. Give us what's the logic or the idea behind that. A ribble of the cost? Um, that, well, because that's how I grew up. I grew up, part of my life was early in San Francisco, which was relatively uh, metropolitan and cosmopolitan. But then a good part of my life was in suburbs, which wasn't, where wasn't any of that kind of culture. It was all post-war consumerism. And it was a language was new cars and uh, TV and old movies on TV, comic books. And uh, I mean, I learned to read and write before I went to school and one, by one of my aunts who was a high school English teacher. And then another aunt introduced me to Rudyard Kipling. And that's why I studied for drawings and I could get attention by doing that. And, uh, and then when I got down to where the suburbs thing, having a car was essential to get attention. And so what I did is I worked on cars. I put flames on them and pinstripes them. I learned how to do that when I was 14 or 15. And when we moved to Michigan, which is the middle of the country and not sort of, it was, it, it, it's, it's really Frank Capra, uh, uh, America. And uh, I went there and they didn't have, they were so happy to see somebody from California and bring this, culture to Michigan. And so I, I, um, I built on that. And I, I brought the car sort of thing and, and, and the custom car culture there and the idea of putting flames on cars and pinstriping cars. And then I did more. I, I did cartoons for the school papers and I did the covers of high school yearbooks. And uh, I did the first swoosh before Nike. I did it on one of my high school yearbooks. Fantastic. Wow. You know, the big message that I'm getting is that if you want to be different, if you want to be noticed among 7.3 billion people, be different, be bold and be daring. Thank you so much, Mike, for those okay. beautiful insights. Thank you. Right. So tell us, what does this campaign, what's the story behind this beautiful campaign? That's Marlon Brand, I presume. And what's so special about this picture? Because he's got a triumph. And that's what I use to market triumphs, was that the connection with them to um, all these famous stars. Mm, okay, that's interesting. Triumph is a, is a motorcycle in, in the US, right? Pardon? What triumph is? Tri triumph is, is a motorcycle. It's a British, in the US. It's a British brand. Or British and, brand. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's one of the oldest uh, brands in the world. And uh, they wanted to come out again and, and be distributed in the United States. So I thought the best thing to do that was hook them up into the popular history of the motorcycle. Since, since mechanically, they couldn't compete with the Japanese, who were much more technically advanced and better price point. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Lovely. So, Michael Jackson, what's the story? Tell us about yeah. I like let, 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 let's, let's try to play the video for this one. Hopefully this time would work. Okay. Okay. So, A plus B can also be equal innovation. I saw the whiz and I thought, this is un unbelievable. Michael Jackson would just all, had to hold himself down not to overpower everybody else. So, you take A and you take B and then I had a fashion illustrator do this for me and I went to present it I made the call first I called his agent I said you know I really want to work on something for him he's gonna be huge he said come over because we're having problems with this next album cover so I went and saw it his album cover looked like it, just, it looked like you know a, a sale at um, that Mervyn's isn't around anymore but well, that's what I thought of it when I did. so I show it to the agent just building at Sunset and Doheny big high ceiling and 
He goes, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't get it. And then from the back, there's a big velvet drape. And his little voice squeaks out and says, I like it. So he comes out and he said, I'll do it. He said, the only thing I really want to do is add, I want to wear white socks. And I said, if you're going to wear white socks, then I want you to get some loafers, wear the white socks, roll up your pants and pull them up in your pockets like Gene Kelly. So we went out to shoot it. He wanted to shoot it to Hollywood Planetarium, which I knew the architecture was going to overpower the whole thing, but that's where Rebel Without a Cause was shot. He wanted to shot. He was late. He just got his license, 21. New rolls all smashed on the sides, ran up, changed in the ladies' room. And I said, remember this? This is what we want. So we went back, went to a photo studio, and I'm sitting there, I can't think of a way to make this work. I went out in the alley, and there's a wall and a loading dock. And I said, well, this looks even more theatrical than just having them standing around. It looks like the back door of a Broadway theater. So I had him stand there and then later added the glow around the socks and, do, and get, get a little animated with the glow. So then that works. I get a call from the agent. He says, he, now he wants two white gloves. And I said, how about one? So he stuck with one. The contrast. So you take him then, it looks like Van upholstery, actually. To I think there's the victory, victory tour. And he went back to the all then the adapter to all black and white. And that became sort of his brand mark. Then he took and took the idea of the glow. I had airbrushed around the socks and had Bob Mackey make these so that they'd glitz. And that look became so iconic that somebody else could wear it and you still get who it was all about. I think we, we've got the message, A plus B. Let's hear it from the legend himself, how he connected the dots. Go ahead, Mike. Well, um, I wanted to introduce him as the talent that he was because he was far in advance of anybody else in that movie, The Wiz. And they... Uh, uh, so I went to his manager, who I knew, and I said, I have an idea for him. And he said, good, because then he showed me the album cover they were working with, and it made him look like a little kid on a mattress ad in a department store. So I went back, and I did what you normally don't really do. And in, in, in movies, you present idea after idea in a visual form. In the record business, everybody just kind of agrees, and you do it. Well, I wanted to do a presentation of how I thought he should be presented. So I, uh, I went to a person, a fashion artist, and I drew him in a tuxedo because I felt we have this kid and now he's introduced in the same uniform as these adult and very famous talents did on Broadway and in Las Vegas. So we got him, uh, I drew him in a tux and uh, the manager didn't know what I was talking about. All of a sudden behind the curtain, I had this little voice, I like it. And he steps out Michael Jackson. He said, okay, I want to do it. I'll do the tux. The only thing I want is to um, wear white socks. And I said, fine. What we'll do is we'll roll up the pants so they show like Gene Kelly did. So you could always see his white socks. And he said, fine. And we did that. And it went on to sell billions. Brilliant. Brilliant. So the next big lesson that we're getting is not only being daring, not only being different, but trying different things which are radical, which are not conventional. And probably that's another secret that you're sharing with us this evening. Great. Yeah. Well, Mike, is there any question? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Well, there he is in the tuxedo with the white socks. And then that's me on the right emulating that for a British magazine. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, here's a cheeky question. Was Mike following the stars or were the stars following Mike? Good question. Um, I was asked by the stars to do things for them. Okay. And then you became a star in the making by doing that because you created many stars. You oh, know, interestingly. You. Well, you guys are making me feel like that. <laughs> Beautiful. I don't know if I ever felt that way, but thank you very much. Thank you. Now you're a legend yourself in your own right. Great. Okay. Leather everywhere. What's the secret, sir? Um, it became a, it was a symbol of, uh, rebel and, uh, mainly, uh, through the Marlon Brando 
wild one figure. And then I did, uh, I just did a whole story and where it emanated from the black leather jacket. And basically it, it had, it caught on for everybody who thought they were a rebel because, you know, you couldn't be in rock and roll unless you were a rebel. It's something to piss off the parrots. And uh, that, I just did a whole study of it and wrote about it and found out where it came from. And I wrote that for different magazines. Very interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Okay, leather today is part of the inner you know, culture. Oh, yeah. And I think you played a very important role in getting that popularized. Yeah. Super. The tough old wild west. We all grew up, you know, with those uh, guns and horses and cowboys. Yeah. And all wild west stories. What is unique about this particular picture? That's James Dean. And that's Giant. That's a frame from the movie Giant. And what it shows is how blue jeans should fit. And that's a, I wanted to use that as a metaphor for when Levi's came up with a woman's blue jeans that fit like a man's. So I put a woman in that position. And it's a metaphor for women's jeans. Very interesting. Very interesting. I think this subtlety in terms of the communication is another very interesting tool that you, you know, employ to get the message outside, right? Oh, uh, today, there's a controversy you. on that on subliminal advertising, but I think subtlety is again a great way to communicate effectively. Let me see if this would work. This the uh, video, hopefully, one okay. of them would work. For the first time in history, Levi's shrink to fit button fly 501 jeans are cut especially for women in the only shrinking denim that tailors itself in the wash to fit every curve like no denim you've ever worn. Shrink to fit 501s, now in the junior department, from Levi's Women's Wear. Travis, you're a year too late. Worked. Yep, did work. <laughs> <It's a good laughs> no, I a problem with that. You've got to reflect on how many kids that you know that were born in that year that are named Travis. That's how influential that was. Wow. wow. <laughs> That's that dot talks about the iconic nature. Now, the, of the, the story of the, the movie, the, 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 the ad itself, or the, the, the story of Travis in the movie? Travis is not in the movie. He's only in my commercial. Wow. So your commercial became so popular that people actually loved the, the image of Travis because of this beautiful woman. Yeah, well, that is a boy's name they hadn't heard, and it sounded you're exactly right, like right? this whole pop thing, and so people named their kids after it. Brilliant. It again talks about the power of branding, the power of communication, iconic metaphors that can translate into yes. cultural action. Brilliant. That's legendary when you Brilliant. get to that part. Excellent. Right. Was it a good image to promote the new woman mindset? That is in terms of, you know, the woman, you know, today we talk about gender equality, but. No, wasn't, it wasn't to do that at all. It was to sell okay. the appeal of jeans. Okay. No, this and, one, the next one. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's the name of my book. Okay. Because I did everything nobody was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So I wow. sold sex and I sold drugs as, you know, Rolling Stone and rock and roll music. I did records. I have a Grammy nomination. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of the things that were movies I sold. That was an <laughs> idea to get a, 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 a sort of a resting title for a book. I know. And in the 60s, you know, it was the uh, it was a hippie movement, the anti-establishment movement, the anti-war. Well, I, I heard a better term for it. It was okay. people discovering this new world called youth. Oh, that's right. And flower people, we call them the flower people who had, yeah. you know, the peace insignias and who had a different meaning towards the world that they wanted to inherit. Yes. Sexy, you're talking about the, uh, the, the, like the Playboy magazines, the Penthouse magazines, the, or the Hustlers magazine, right? Yes. Okay, so we don't, we don't want our audience to misunderstand the color. Drugs, basically, what, what, what does that entail to? Rolling Stone. Oh, the Rolling Stones. Okay. Yeah. And the rock and roll basically is? The albums, all the different record albums I did. Okay. Now it makes sense. 
Yes, okay. I have Grammy nominated. Yeah, tongue in cheek title, by the way. Huh? <laughs> that tongue in cheek title, and probably it conveys the message much more evocatively. Than yeah, and it's, well, it's got the key words. That's right. And that sells, right? It still sells. Yes. Mm, interesting. Okay. So, Mr. Pop Culture. So, that's uh, the cover of your book. Let's move on to branding cool. Yes. Tell us more about this. Well, any consumer is a reflection of the product they buy. So, you have to tell them what, what's being sold is cool. So they they can be cool, and that and that's in the execution of the marketing. Interesting. How do you translate this concept of cool in a digital world, where we talk about digital marketing, digital imagery, and digital technologies? Well, it's just another medium. It's got nothing to do with the technology. It's mm. just the way things are communicated today. What's interesting about that today? Like social media, people treat social media like they did rock and roll when I was young. That it's the devil. You know? <laughs> okay. All these people, you look at what is their argument against it? Oh, you know, well, because it's the devil's work. Well, so they said the same thing about music. You know. I think we have survived all those onslaughts. I was still raring to go, and uh, it's been a fascinating conversation so far, and. Uh, now, probably we'll take some questions, uh, Dr. Abbott, from the audience. I have one question, which is already given by Dr. Summer. Uh, what was your most memorable experience? And an extension of that is, what was the most, what was the funniest experience you had? So most memorable, and then you can tell us more about uh, the funniest experience you've so far had in your life. Uh, well, I think the memorable was all the attention I got, particularly for editorial work, because it's not um, you. You get this, you know. You get your credit. You get your name associated with the work. And I put a lot of high concept. I put a lot of thinking in the editorial work I did, and that was very satisfying to get the feedback, because it's not anonymous. Um, we're advertising, nobody knows who did it until you enter all the different competitions. And I've got, but I do have advertising work in the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian. And I have um, my photographs in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So that's good recognition. In fact, I went to the Library of Congress to look my work up. Unbelievable. You climb these big, big ladders way up high, and their mind was like, you know, two stories up and we had a room that tall, but it was a, it was a good experience. Fantastic. What about your funniest moment? The one you'd like to laugh out loud? Well, my cousin and I just, we got to get a laugh out of anything. So I don't think there was ever one. <laughs> That's so sweet. You could laugh at anything, right? That's brilliant. Yeah. Yes. Let me move on to another interesting question. Uh, somebody wants to know regarding movie posters, who was the most difficult client to please? Um, not really any. I mean, basically, because you constantly have, you have to be very productive and get a lot of stuff done to show mm. people. And you can't mm. take it personally because it's rejection after rejection that they'll eventually, they eventually pay for it all. It's just, uh, mm. okay. most, people, most people can't okay. deal with that. But mm. I was very prolific, and so I could come up with lots of solutions. I think it's that library that you said. That library has so many ideas, a cornucopia of ideas, that you keep churning one after the other and then seeing. Yes. An extension of that question by another person, uh, you know, which was your most difficult campaigns, and whether you could share some interesting experiences on movie projects, especially with uh, Mr. Spielberg and Mr. Kubrick. Well... Uh, the ones I did a lot of work for are Spielberg and uh, and Star Wars, and uh, they weren't difficult at all. Very unaffected, very self confident people, not a problem. Interesting. Uh, yeah, but Kubrick. Pardon? Stanley Kubrick. You worked with him as well. 
I think so. I have to look up. I did 300 movie campaigns. So I have to look up. No worries. No worries. There's another, There's another question. Mr. Mike, building a brand, you were going alone this way or was it with a team? If alone, was it difficult? And what difficulties did you face? If with a team, how did you find like-minded people? Very interesting question. Well, it's not so much like-minded. It's being um, disciplined. You okay. know, you get work done on time to a schedule. And uh, I had a, a, an office with my people. Each one had a different skill. Some were good at the drawing of ideas. Some were good at the lettering of ideas. Others were good at helping finish ideas. And uh, uh, just, some of them couldn't ever. And then I had a lot of outside sources. And some of them were good at making deadlines. And some of them were awful. So you just have to be, work around it, you know. Hmm. That's right. You need a more disciplined team. And, uh, of course, get them to work on your ideas and mindsets. Great. Sure. We have a lot of youngsters this evening as your audience. And one question they'd like to know is, what is your special message to the young generation? Um, well, I always fell into what I did by accident. It just happened to be there. It happened to be the next thing. So um, if you have a specific goal in mind, follow it. If you don't, just go with the flow and see what happens. And every situation that comes up, consider an opportunity. Beautiful message. Beautiful. I mean, you've got a goal, go for it. Yes. If you're confused, just go with the flow. Yes. Make the best of what comes and try to make that your pursuit and your passion. There is yeah. there's one, one more question there, I think there is. No, a lot more. I'll, I'll just go one by one. Okay. So here's another very interesting question. Did you ever have a moment and said, I give up because it was getting too much? No. Brilliant. Boy, I, that's a good question. Yeah, I felt it got to be too nuts, much. That was my failing. <laughs> Superb. Superb. Never give up. Great yeah. message. Sir. Okay, one more. As long as they keep paying, never give up. Absolutely. <laughs> Let the money keep coming, man. All right. Yeah. Now here's another question. One thing which you would do the same if you had to again, and one you would do different if asked to do now. I think that's an interesting question. Well, I was given the opportunity to make a feature movie, and I didn't because I just saw what it entailed. And uh, and if I had that opportunity again, I might take it. Wow. Beautiful. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's more work than anything I ever got involved with because I've worked on a couple... I mean, I worked on Apocalypse Now. I'm in it. I create a lot of materials for it. That one, hmm. it was a never-ending nightmare all the time. It got started and it got stopped and went back and forth. But uh, I never saw there was a simple solution to making a movie. Beautiful. Okay. How has the industry and the outlook changed over the many decades that you've been involved in the business? Has it become better to work now? Or was it more enjoyable working in the older era? Well, I was through a lot of changes. I worked through a lot of eras. So I don't think there was, you know, work was work. It, it just, we when we got into solving it more uh, digitally and technically, that helped. Um, you know, one, it helped for being able to create a lot of variables to show a client than before. And uh, no, this. It is what it is. It is what it has been. Super. And now one very interesting philosophic question, rather. What is your biggest regret in life? Hmm. I don't know if I have any. Let me think. It's only like regrets would be depressing. I don't want to be depressed. Oh, brilliant. I think that's what we need now, you know. That's a yeah. leadership attitude. Yep. That's a that's a mindset. That's an attitude. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, whoever you're hearing from wherever, I think the big message that's coming out is you need to have that mindset never to give up. Be bold, be courageous, yeah. be contrarian, be a rebel with a cause. Yeah, and, 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 and no submit, submit your invoices on time. Yeah, absolutely. Last yeah. Uh, few questions. Since the world has shifted online due to COVID, what are the new trends that you can suggest for mm -hmm. digital branding? And if you have any ideas, you can share it with the audience. Well, the availability of things like type. 
Mm. You know, that you could have it on your own, not have to send out to a type house and do those things. The ability to, with Photoshop and Illustrator to, to do photo work because a lot of motion picture stuff and, and record stuff involved, you know, cleaning up people's looks and you can do doing that digitally was much easier than sending out to people to paint it. Mm, that's right. Yes. And that, that was yeah, a great, great. Okay. One another question. How would you be choosing and selecting people? What would be the criteria you set for people whom you work with? And do you listen to people from your team and accept their ideas or do you follow your vision alone? No, what I do is I get the people who can specialize in certain things and I listen to them and everybody gets credit. And I think that's another very important message in a world of uh, competition. The key word is collaboration. We get ideas yes. from everybody, put it together. Brilliant. Thank you, sir. That's a very, yeah. very important message. Great. Oh, thank you. Great. Any final thoughts? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Michael, go ahead. Oh, yeah, Am I answering a question? Okay, now yeah, I, 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 no. Dr. Christopher. Yeah. So I think uh, we have uh, finished the questions from the audience. I mean, okay. uh, it's been an absolutely amazing experience. We learned so much. And okay, there is one more question that's coming. How do you see, uh, which do you see more effective? Is it a photo or a video? So here goes they're another question. They're different, different strokes from different media. You know, it's, uh, it, it, you know, the, you talk about Michelangelo, he didn't have videos, but he still made an impression. So it all yeah. depends, you know, on the message. Mm. It depends on the message, the metaphor, and of course the man himself, Mike. The medium is the message. The medium is the message. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, so that's the, metaphor, I mean, that's the message, the motive, the man, and of course the medium and the message. This is the first time in my career life uh, that I ever heard that the medium is used is the message. That's yeah. really I'm sorry. That's Marshall McLuhan. Yeah, Marshall McLuhan. That's right. Now, what I'm, I didn't hear that, what I'm saying, but uh, embedding it in your work, philosophy is uh, something else. You, you can hear it in one way, but uh, following it is another. Uh, yeah. Is there any other questions, Dr. Christopher, you want to take? There are a couple more that are there on the questions. I'm just quickly checking that. And uh, I think this is one of the youngsters. So I think we need to answer it. How do you maintain this positive and persevering outlook? Oh. <laughs> just doing it. That's the, the reward is doing the work. Hmm doing the work. And I think it's also a mindset thing that you need to believe that you can do the work at whatever age you are. So continue doing what you do, love, do, do what you're doing, what you love doing. Yeah. And do that. Yeah. Well, because I could always get attention for it. So that's what I wanted. <laughs> you are so brutally frank, sir. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> what, one, one thing, the one thing is, is impressive yeah. about Michael. Uh, I think he always, if I'm, I, I could be mistaken, correct me, Michael, he always looked the greater job to do next. Yes. Uh, because yes, he, exactly. that, that was his biggest challenge as his momentum uh, and the drive, where yes. what could be better uh, the, the next, because that was his motiv motivation, because money wasn't it, because it was, it's there. The, yeah. the, reward, the fame, the, the, but I think what drives him is just to keep coming up with the greater ideas to be next. Yes. That, this is what we talk about in Talents of Endearment. What should happen next? And uh, Michael uh, actually is, uh, 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 what we call it, is the living proof of that, mm. uh, of it. There is one Brilliant. last question, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Christopher. Yeah, one last question, which is again, a very interesting philosophic question. Did you always plan or lived life a quarter mile at a time? No, it's just the way it went. Okay, and you take it as it comes. You take life as it comes. You know, he used a very interesting word called flow. We need to develop that passion to get flow at even the simple moments and make them magical. 
Yes. Uh, it's been a very amazing, interesting, fascinating conversation. Uh, as I said, a legend can, you know, keep people patiently waiting. We had a total of almost about 90 plus people for this evening. It's been an amazing experience. Dr. Abbott, over to you. And on behalf of all of us, Mike, it's been an absolutely amazing experience. Good luck. God bless you. And thank give you. you. Thank, thank you. All. Thank you. Thank all. you. My, Michael, I, I like to, to leave a quote. Whenever I talk to Michael, especially in the last few weeks, working hard to prepare a lot of the work and what's to come next, is we all watch those martial arts movies, the Kung Fu movies, where the old master's sitting, watching the, uh, his students with yeah. a bamboo stick <laughs> flying over his head, waiting for, for, for them to make that mistake. So whenever I communicate with Michael, no matter the, the world experience that I have developed over the years, I still feel humbled by his down-to-earth demeanor. And nope. if, 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 that is, if anything is impressive, that is that. Uh, for the person to become so worldly known, with his work that are uh, being named after with the things is impressive just to see how humble down to earth simple person very little spoken but well spoken right and we're i'm one person that i would love to, to always say is you're, you're i'm your student and with that we are planning a mike salisbury fellowship that is coming up, uh, we're going to be announcing the, the, the calendar of the three workshops associated with that. And you will be also connected with Michael for two years uh, of that experience uh, to take you to the heights that uh, we dream. Uh, I, I, yes, nothing worked well at the beginning of this session, but I think the experience that we have had with a living legend is really in a moment that we cherish. I cannot forget it. I don't think any of us is gonna forget it. And what we hope for is what's to come next with that. And also we, we will be sharing the dates and the details of that fellowship uh, and the date and the workshops that my uh, the, that will Michael will show how this uh, that he did the, some of the things that he did of his marvelous work uh, as well. We also have a, 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 a career lab coming up, which basically that talking about how do we create legendary passionate students. Uh, that's coming up on the third, uh, the March 11th. The link is available to you here, but also on the handouts, you'll see all the links that you might need to, to register. Right now with the generosity of the Board of Trustees, we are making this a very, uh, sponsored three days of the, uh, the, the sessions for free. And if you like the program, you can subscribe to it and continue. And if not, you can just keep it and then it's our gift to you. And we're proud to say Michael is gonna be one of the grandfathers uh, that is gonna uh, overlook this program with us as well in addition to some of the activities that we have. We also launched a smart internship that we start sharing with universities around the world uh, because what we are hoping to accomplish here, not to stop at this event, but what we want to do is the legacy of Michael that he cre developed, created over 50 some years, uh, it shouldn't be left uh, untapped. It should be followed. And we would love to have that uh, activities of those programs really follow his footsteps. Because imagine with one Michael what we did, Imagine if we can have thousands of Mike Salisbury's around the world with his footsteps to success and legendary works, what we can accomplish with that. Uh, Dr. Asim al Haj, you are with us. I think, we, would you have a word to share with us? I gave you the mic and the video. Dr. Asim? Okay, uh, he's not uh, hearing us. Uh, Mr. Osman Sultan, do you have a final word, please? We can't hear you. Your mic, your, your, your mic is muted. You must hear me now? Yes. So, in addition to reiterating what uh, Dr. Christopher, yourself, and how excited we were to have Michael uh, with us today, uh, if you allow me, Dr. Abed, I want to add uh, 
say to Michael that we learn from what we hear today, what we heard today. We learn. Oh, uh, thank you. I, I, this is a dimension of uh, the brand that you brought. This is a highlight on brands, uh, which is really in, in the soul. And I like your answer. So how do you see this now in the digital world? And I fully agree. The medium can change, but it's what's in the mind and the way you position this in the mind and the soul that will never change, whatever the medium is. So thank you well, for that. Thank you for these precious uh, in, insights, the balance between how do you present the feature, the benefit, the value might change a little bit. And there is a new balance to be a stroke in uh, the world of digital and the digital technology, because technology can allow different things. But the spirit of that, the things that you started, the things that you took to another dimension, that will not change. And for us, it was a great moment that you gave us some of these insights. Thanks a lot, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Osman. Uh, Dr. Christopher, do you have one final word? The message could be the, you know, the, the, the factor, but I think it's the man and the mind. So with all the artificial intelligence, human intelligence still far surpasses technology and artificial intelligence. So yeah. salute to you, to the spirit of Michael and the human spirit and human ingenuity. Thank you. We live this evening at the edge of chaos because yeah. what most of us have known has we we I've, I discovered this evening. Uh, the, regardless, the, the, there was so many times that I've talked to Michael, but I have so much that I've learned from him today is memorable. But before we leave, there is a couple of polls that I would like to share. Uh, ask every uh, you guys after this conversation. What are your chances to build a legendary brand or a business? I'm sharing the, uh, the results with everyone. It's not visible, Dr. Abed. Refresh your page. Okay, wonderful. The next question that I have, what are your chances to becoming a legend? I see people started that on their own. Wonderful. In life, we go through stops. Some of them are in despair. Some of them are encouraging. Some of them are uh, just a spirit lifter. And this evening was a stop that was planned to be another session to bring about a mindset change. But we discovered with my mentor, Michael, that stops could be surprisingly amazing, filled with things that you didn't even expect. With the terminologies, it's the library in your mind that really keeps you going and not to look back and just keep forward to change things. With that, we had an opportunity to meet with a living legend today. I don't know when it will be next time that we're gonna be meeting another legend. Hopefully one of you will become the next legend that we will meet in a year, two, five years, and 10 years. Nothing is impossible. Look at the, 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 the footsteps of Michael over the years. He never had a mind block. He always looked ahead. He always looked to change and he always looked at what will be the greatest thing to do next. He never right. stopped. 
at the success because success wasn't the measure for him. What was me the measure for him, from my understanding, is the great things that he keeps up popping out to the world to change the world. The world that he didn't like before. So he made it his career throughout the stops that he made to change the things that he didn't like. That was, he was, that was his passion. That was his, the secret of his success. And that's where we capitalize on talents of endearment in changing. How to, change, how to look at things that you don't like and you would like to change them. Make that your story. Make that your career. Make that your journey. And that's how you're going to live the, the, the future of your dreams. Because Michael, the future of Michael's dreams was to change the things that he didn't like. He didn't care about. And he became, because he was passionate about it, he became very successful at it. He became a legend. I wish I would have... 50% of his knowledge, but maybe someday we will. We all will, as long as we have that determination to flow and never let anything stop us anywhere on, on, our, on our way to success forward. At the end, you have the information at the handouts. We will send you the recording of this session with the missing videos, <clears throat> again, to, that you'll be able to see, it, to see them and hear them well. And we thank you for joining us this evening. Again, I cannot thank you enough, Mr. Mike Salisbury, Dr. Christopher, Mr. Osman Sultan. Uh, we are in a journey to change the world. Hopefully someday we will see the better world than we had it in our times and our years. Thank you all. Please stay safe. See you soon. Until then, take care. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael.